Welcome to this soul lifting broadcast, which has been put together for your spiritual growth and to make greatness common right where you are. Be sure to make the best of this moment as God takes the lead in all that concerns you. Luke chapter 12. Let's take our opening text from Luke chapter 12. As we discuss what's the big deal about life, where we send out IVs and that, that, that was the caption. And that, that's the subject of my discussion this morning. And I, I pray that God will make this a blessing to all of us in the name of Jesus. What's the big deal about life? Luke chapter 12, I'll read from verse 13. Luke chapter 12, I'll read from verse 13. What's the big deal about life? This story, the passage of the scripture that I'm about to read, is... Um, an experience that Jesus had with someone and he was trying to give a better world view, a better perspective to life. So he told a parable to buttress his point of view. He told a parable to buttress his point of view. Luke chapter 12, I read from verse 13. Then one from the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. Verse 14. But he said to him, man, who made me a judge or an arbitrator over you? And he said to them, take heed and beware of covetousness. For one's life does not consist in the abundance of the things he possesses. Then he spoke a parable to them saying, the ground of a certain rich man yielded plentifully. And uh, he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do, since I have no room to store my crops? So he said, I will do this. I will pull down my bands and build greater. And there I will store all my crops and my goods. And I will say to my soul, So, you have many goods laid up for many years. Take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. Verse 20. But God said to him, Fool, this night your soul will be required of you. Then, whose will those things be which you have provided. So is he who lay up treasure for himself and is not rich towards God. The Lord bless the hearing and the reading of his word. Look at your neighbor and tell your neighbor, I'm rich towards God. Say it again, say I'm rich towards God. In life, it has been said again and again, I read it again recently, reading through the biography of um, Steve Jobs, the former CEO of um, Apple. If you read that very bulky book, one of the most striking things for me in that, in that book was the fact that Steve said, you don't connect the dots going forward, you connect the dots backwards. It simply means that in life, things don't make sense until sometimes you look back. And when you look back, you see traces of intelligent designs. You see traces of things that it takes someone greater than you to have been able to put this kind of thing together. That there's no amount of wisdom of your own that could have worked something like this out. Are you still with me this morning? And you see, when you read this passage of the scripture, one of the striking things that will come into your heart is, is it that God is against success? A, a man went to Jesus, tell my brother to share with me. All that Jesus wanted to do at that point is to help this guy to shape his worldview. It wasn't wrong for him to want to share with his brother. But Jesus saw his heart. He saw beyond the physical. He saw his heart. He knew that his driving force happened to be what he could get from the inheritance. 
and he tried to help him to shape his mind. And he said, the quality of a man's life does not consist in the abundance of the things that he possesses. Don't, you know, live in this certain way. Live in this certain way. Let's, let's shape your worldview a little. Then he told the parable. Okay, this is a successful man. But everything was all about him. He said, let me make my plans. I will build new bands. I will pull everything down. I will, that which I have acquired, I will store it. Then, he, you know, he was talking about his plans, his plans. Then he got to a point. He said, then I will say to my soul. When he got to that point, God said, well, you have passed your boundaries. I agree that you own everything. But you, your soul, not for you. So God showed up and called him a fool. A fool, not because... He was successful? No. A fool not because he was bragging? No. A fool because he thought it was all about him. Including his life. He thought it was all about him. So when, when he got to the point of, I will say to my soul, then God said, uh, um, you are a fool. He said, tonight, your soul will be required of you. And then we are going to see who owns every other thing. Because in life, Life can play a trick on us many times and then we'll start to feel like everything is all about us. Your life is not about you. You are a piece, a puzzle piece, a puzzle piece in God's masterpiece. The big picture does not revolve around you. You are a part of the big picture, a part of the big picture. Any life that is lived like this will not be void of a meaning. But any life that is lived otherwise, when you think that everything revolves around you, will often lack meaning and sense. Apostle Peace that chooses to stand alone serves no purpose. It doesn't make sense on its own. To find value and derive the utmost satisfaction in life, you must willingly take your place in God's ultimate puzzle. That's how it works. You must take your place in God's ultimate puzzle. So don't make your life about the pursuit of success only. God wants us successful. In fact, God is far more interested in success than some of us think. Third John, verse 2, the Bible says, Beloved, I wish above all things that you prosper and be in health, even as your soul prospers. In the book of Psalms, the psalmist, you know, um, uh, said this. He said, The Lord be magnified, who takes pleasure in the prosperity of his servants. So God delights in success. He delights in divine prosperity. In fact, God delights in much more than success. He delights in significance. Because in life, we start out with survivor. Then from survivor to success, from success to significance. And God wants us to live a life of significance. God wants us to live a good life. But we must always realize that it's not all about us. It's not all about us. There's something much more that God has a mind. Spiritual emptiness is a universal disease caused by self-focus. Spiritual emptiness is a universal disease. There's always a point that people get to that you just realize that you can't find any meaning for everything. And the only cure for spiritual emptiness is when you shift the focus away from yourself. Let me read Ecclesiastes chapter 2. Uh, from the mouth of one of the wisest, in fact, the acclaimed wisest man that ever lived, Solomon, the great king Solomon. In Ecclesiastes chapter 2, when you read verse 10 and 11, I read, Whatever my eyes desire, I do not keep from them. I did not withhold my heart from any pleasure. For, any, for my heart rejoiced in all my labor. And this was my reward from all my labor. Then 
I look on all the works that my hands had done, and on the labor in which I had toiled. And indeed, all was vanity and grasping for the wind. There was no profit under the sun. The man who wrote this came to this after, you know, conducting all kinds of experiments, ex sexual experiments. Solomon still has a record that has not been broken. You know, had a field with, by a thousand women. It was a full experimentation. A thousand women. He had caught jesters. But he said that everything is vanity. Grasping for the wind. Everything is vanity. Grasping for the wind. The quest for self-pleasure drains. It drains. It drains. The quest for God's pleasure is what feels. Can I say that one more time? The quest for self-pleasure drains. It drains us. It brings us to the point where we begin to feel like there's no meaning to all this after all. I've tried. I've done this. I have done that. But the quest for God's pleasure, it fills us. Jesus met the woman at the well in John chapter 4. And there was a theological argument that ensued. And at the end of it, Jesus told the woman, you have water from the well. If you drink of this well, you will thirst again. But I have water that I can give you. Whoever drinks of this one will never thirst again. Why? Because you will gain a vital connection with God that leads to the quest for God's pleasure, which feels and continually feels, continually feels, continually feels. Nothing in this world satisfies. If it's about sex, you have it, and um, if it will finish, and the moment you have it, you will never feel like having again, you are fully satisfied, it will have been okay. If it's about food, you eat the best from the best restaurant in the world, and just give yourself a few hours. You're hungry again. You're hungry again. A complex step tree of your life comprises of decisions that you could never have made for yourself. And this suggests that your life must have been a product of an intelligent design. Where and when you were born was not your decision. What sex you will be was not your decision. Your parents were not your decision. Am I saying the truth? Your nationality or tribe was never your decision. Your siblings, if you have any, were not your decision. In fact, when you will die, except for the sin of suicide, you cannot decide exact time that you will die. Now, whoever made all these decisions definitely has other decisions that are beyond you. Yeah. The, the problem is you, we get to a point in life and because now you're an adult, you can make certain decisions, then you begin to feel powerful. You begin to feel powerful. You didn't decide when to be born, but because you can choose a woman now that you call a wife or girlfriend, then you start to feel powerful. Because you can fire your boss now and get a new job, you start to feel powerful. And then you begin to think that it's all about you. Yeah. You begin to feel like it's all about you. Because you have the means now. You can decide which kind of car to drive, which kind of house to live in. In fact, some people can even fire a spouse and get another one. That's how powerful we feel sometimes. You tell somebody, pack your load and go. Or you tell somebody, I'm done with you. If it is the woman, I'm done with you. Somebody, you hand them the sack letter and you walk out. That's how powerful we feel when we get to a point where we can take decisions on our own. But what about all the decisions that have been very meaningful, meaningful, very pivotal in your life that you did not make? Whoever made all those decisions 
have a stake in your life and in your destiny. Are you still with me this morning? Yeah, he has a stake in your life. He has a stake in your destiny. He has plans that transcend the current time. Say amen, somebody. Amen. So God is always waiting, knocking at the door, and waiting for a time that you will come alive to this truth, which is the, one of the most pivotal truth to existence. It's not about me. I'm a part of a big puzzle. I'm a part of a big picture. And I have a part to play there. And until I see myself as a part of something that's bigger than me, my life will never have a meaning. I may never be cured of spiritual emptiness. Let me start to round up by discussing uh, by four points and features of a self-appointed driver. You know, one of the biggest questions you can ask yourself in life is, what is driving my life? That's one of the biggest questions you can ask yourself in life. What is driving my life? What is my strongest motivation? What is driving my life? That's one of the biggest questions that you can ask yourself. So when you yield your life and allow God to be the driver, some things will happen that you may not even be able to explain. Your failure to yield your life for God to take the driver's seat will lead to certain other things taking the driver's seat in your life. One of them is materialism. That was what Jesus was trying to address in that parable. A self-appointed driver, I call him the SAD, self-appointed driver, will open up himself to materialism. And materialism, when it's full-blown, we always put at the back of your mind the need to amass, you know, personal wealth. And, and the trick is that life lies to us by saying that the more you have, the happier you will be. The more secure you will be. In fact, the more important you will be. And the problem is that it's a trick. You can have a little more today and feel happier, but the happiness is temporary. Because the utmost source, the ultimate source of joy and happiness is God. So a self-appointed driver will open up himself or herself to be driven by materialism. But Jesus said, don't forget that the quality of a man's life is not determined by the things that he possesses. In a nutshell, he's saying this, your net worth is not the same as your self-worth. Your value is not based on your valuables. Your net worth is not the same as your self-worth. We derive our self-worth from God. We came from him. And if we disconnect from him, then material things will want to define us. As good as material things are, we must never allow them to define us. All that I have, and all that I am, and all that I will ever have, I recognize and accept that they all will come from God. And if they will come from God, then God owns everything. That was the mistake of the rich fool in Luke 12. Instead of him to say, God, so why have you blessed me so much? Life, ladies and gentlemen, is about the stewardship of affluence and influence. The stewardship of affluence and influence. Whenever we fail in our bid to be a good steward of affluence and influence, God shows up, and a lot of the time, it's never a palatable story. Another thing that you open yourself up to when you allow God, I mean, when you disallow God from being the driver of your life, is that you may open yourself up to be driven by approval, the approval of other people. You can also be driven, like Moses, by guilt. When you refuse for God to drive your life and you become the self-appointed driver, guilt can also take over. When driven by guilt, you spend your life running from regrets and hiding your shame. Guilt-driven people are manipulated by memories. 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 Memories of the past. Also, fear is another thing that will 
that we open the door for when we decide and appoint ourselves as the driver of our lives. Ladies and gentlemen, except God is in your life, you don't have what it takes to deal with fear. It takes a vital connection with God for any man to walk free of fear. A vital connection with God. That's the only cure for fear. Fear is a self-imposed prison that will keep you from becoming what God intends for you to be. I want to challenge someone this morning that without knowing God and his will for your life, life is motion without meaning. It is activity without direction. It's trivia, petty, and pointless. Thank you for listening. We hope you are truly blessed. Please feel free to email us at info at elevationng.org for all inquiries or to share any testimonies. You can also follow us on our social media channels at ElevationNG to have access to real-time updates on all broadcasts and special programs. Till we come your way again, keep making greatness common.